Election season is heating up in key battleground states. A look at voter registration on Syracuse University's campus. And a new kids program at SUNY Upstate. All that plus weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Good morning, I'm Vinaya Johnson. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Zach Card. Here's a look at today's top story. It seems like Mother Nature can't quite make up her mind this week. Let's turn it over to Max for our latest forecast. Max? Hey, good morning, guys. As I stand out here, I realize that I'm definitely way too overdressed for this weather. I'm in long sleeves and pants, but um, it's just beautiful out here. There's barely a cloud in the sky. Right now, Syracuse at 66 degrees. Uh, it really feels like 68 degrees, though, with the humidity of 63%. There is a light breeze, so uh, that does cool you off a little bit um, at 12 miles per hour. Um, now, coming up, I'll have a look at what the, your Halloween forecast is going to look like and your rest of the week, guys. Former President Donald Trump is defending his Madison Square Garden rally after many controversial remarks. I don't think anybody has ever seen anything like what happened the other night at Madison Square Garden. It was like a love fest, an absolute love fest, and it was my honor to be involved. This comment comes in backlash over remarks at his event by a comedian describing Puerto Rico as floating island of garbage. Allies of the former president have expressed concern that this comment could have repercussions, especially given the amount of Puerto Ricans in key battleground states. In an interview last night, Trump said that the comedian behind the offensive quote, comments, quote, probably shouldn't have attended his rally. Former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris are focusing on key battleground states that might determine the outcome of the 2024 presidential election, which is less than a week away. Donald Trump is rallying supporters today with events in Green Bay, Wisconsin and Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Just days before the election, the Washington Post is losing subscribers after Jeff Bezos decided to not endorse a presidential candidate. The Post prepared to release an editorial piece endorsing Vice President Kamala Harris when it was pulled last minute. Over 200,000 people have unsubscribed from the news outlet since Monday. According to sources at the paper, Bezos defended his decision, saying that presidential endorsements create a perception of bias. Other publications have followed suit, including the Los Angeles Times and over 200 Gannett outlets, which is America's largest newspaper chain. We are just five days away from the election, and if you plan to vote, now's the time to get to the polls. Our Zatazia Duffy asked students if they had plans to vote. Zatazia? Good morning, Zach and Vanaya. Election day is less than a week away, and with polling sites heaving across the nation, it was no surprise at how many Syracuse students were registered to vote. Of course I'm registered to vote. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. Still, others remain undecided. I think I'm registered, but I haven't decided yet. Uh, personally, I don't like follow politics a whole lot. Like I'm in the military, so whoever wins is going to be my boss no matter what, so... I feel like it's not a great pick either way. Not much of a good voter, you know. I vote here and there, but uh, after I found out that I'm registered to vote, I'm old enough, then sometimes I just be thinking I could do it, but sometimes I'm like, you know what? Let me just wait for a minute. How will undecided voters impact this election, or will they turn out to the polls? That is yet to be answered. If you're at home and wondering if you're registered to vote, you can check your status on elections.ny.gov, select your county, and fill in your first and last name, date of birth, and zip code. To register in the state of New York, go to voterlookup.elections.ny.gov and create an account or log into an existing one. Answer the prompts, and once properly filled out, you'll get a confirmation email with a list of polling sites. And for a mail-in ballot form, you can visit your state's um, circuit clerk office and you can just request that it be sent to you here in New York State through their online portal. See you at the polls. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Zatazia Duffy.
Thanks, it's Natasia. Been. It's been eight days since we've last learned of the hazing allegations made against the second SU fraternity, Psi Upsilon. How has the university handled the issue and how are students reacting? Our Mike Lamore has the report. I always knew there was a type of hazing, but I never knew it got that bad. I'm not surprised, honestly, because like, there's like a reputation of that everywhere in any frat. New today, students are reacting to two SU fraternities, Phi Kappa Psi and Psi Upsilon, after being placed on an interim suspension for leaked videos showing alleged hazing. The like goal of like your pledge class, I know it's to like bond to get closer to each other, but that doesn't mean they have to like throw up on each other. I just feel like that's disgusting. I wouldn't want to get throw up on my face and stuff like that. I feel like I wouldn't want to be friends with the people making me do that, and I feel like I wouldn't be able to get past that. Now NCC News reached out to both fraternities here at SU as well as their national chapters, even the Interfraternity Council here at SU, none of which have responded. But Syracuse University got back saying that the investigation is ongoing and there is no comment at this time other than that both of these fraternities are placed on an interim suspension until a resolution can be met. In the meantime, the Interfraternity Council issued a statement saying it is prepared to do whatever it can to support anyone who has experienced or been impacted by hazing. Reporting for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Mike Lamort. Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, a new behavioral health unit in central New York is tackling mental health struggles in teens. Plus, this Halloween will be an eerily warm one. All that and more coming after the break. Welcome back. Time to check your weather for today. Max is in studio with a full look at your weather forecast. Hey guys, yeah, today is just an abnormally warm day. Uh, taking a look now, um, the high today is going to be 77, uh, but that record was actually 79 back in 1946, so we actually were still seeing those warm temperatures. Um, and then we had a low of 59 for today, and then it was a low of 19 in 1928, so just these temperatures are really just everywhere. But let's take a look at your daily planner for today. Um, so starting off, you know, this morning, uh, you can expect, you know, warm temperatures, but that's going to get up uh, even higher to the upper 70s um, and then it's going to turn a little bit cloudier. we're going to see some more cloud coverage um, but we're still remaining pretty warm within the 70s and as we get into the night uh, tonight uh, it's going to be you know still warm a very warm day today and uh, with partly cloudy skies and let's take a look at your five-day forecast so uh, today or tomorrow excuse me Halloween 80 degrees so it's going to be very warm if you're going out trick-or-treating or going out and celebrating you can definitely put on shorts or short sleeves uh, Friday it's going to be a little bit more cloudier uh, with 62 degrees definitely less warm than what we're going to see tomorrow over the weekend it's going to get chilly again we're going to see 49 on Saturday 56 on Sunday and then we see some rain back on Monday but that's all I have for you guys back to you a new program for kids is opening at SUNY Upstate Hospital. The program will support kids with mental health and learning disabilities. Autumn Ryan joins us live with more on the story. Thanks guys. The Biobehavioral Health Unit is the first of its kind in New York State. The new unit is an inpatient facility for kids ages 5 to 17 who struggle with mental health and learning disabilities. Each child will be admitted for six weeks and receive 24-hour care. Some people in Syracuse believe the new unit will be useful for the children. Our very own reporter and anchor, Zatazia Duffy, says she would have benefited from mental health resources when suffering from anxiety in high school. One of the most difficult things to deal with was the fact like I had no idea what was going on with me. I felt really like bad about feeling anxious. Duffy's anxiety started around 17 years old when she had to balance her schoolwork and extracurricular activities. She says managing everything was stressful. She remembers barely sleeping at night and shaking during exams. These problems continue until she started therapy in college. I was really given really great coping skills on how to manage my stress and anxiety and that really helped me. The unit will give the children similar skills. Each child gets an individualized treatment plan that includes a medication adjustment, behavioral treatment, and family therapy sessions. The program's director, Dr. Henry Rohn, says their goal is to ensure children who did not previously have access get the help they need. Teach families and children the, the skills they need to overcome these behaviors and to live life to their fullest. Inpatient facility will treat kids with a range of disorders including anxiety, 
ADHD, and autism. Dr. Roan says early intervention reduces the likelihood of negative behaviors continuing into adulthood. Dealing with behaviors that need to change and when you're trying to change a behavior, it's, it's always helpful to do that as early as you can because that just improves the overall learning that they can do in their life. The Biobehavioral Unit will welcome two new patients on November 6th. Autumn Ryan, Mornings on the Hill. SUNY is hoping to open another inpatient center for adults in the future. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Autumn Ryan. Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, the Yankees avoided the sweep, plus Syracuse women's volleyball coming off their first ACC win in how long? That and more coming after the break. Every once in a while, a day like today, a Wednesday, brings you this much sports action, and it's taken three of us to break it all down. Welcome <laughs> to sports here on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Nathaniel Cunningham, alongside Geraldine, Paulia, and Nico Horning. There's just so much to get to, and as much as I'd like to talk to you guys, we've got to get to the action. So let's stop wasting your time, and let's get right to it. We have to, we have to start with the hottest and the coldest team in the 315, Syracuse football. The Orange were thumped 41-13 by 19th-ranked Pittsburgh on Thursday. However, that game is behind them. And now the Orange have a tough task in Virginia Tech on Saturday. And honestly, anything can happen. They say history repeats itself. And the last time the Hokies and the Orange faced off, VT walked out with a 38-10 win. But Syracuse has an 8-2 record when playing Virginia Tech at home. And this rivalry goes all the way back to the Big East, where SU and VT played for over a decade. Adding another wrinkle into the story is the fact SU quarterback Kyle McCord is top the ACC in total offense, while his counterpart on Saturday, Chiron Drones, is second to last in the conference. However, both still made the 2024 Davey O'Brien class finalist. So honestly, anything can happen come this Saturday. But a team that's had back and forth action like Syracuse football has been Syracuse volleyball and Geraldine's got more. Syracuse Volleyball won their first game, their first ACC game this weekend since beating Virginia in 2022. She the Orange defeated Virginia Tech eight, in a five-set matchup, ending a 31-match conference losing streak. The first set went to the Hokies after a close opening set. Syracuse then retaliated in the second set, building a 17-9 lead early and eventually closing the set out 25-16. Virginia Tech came back to win set three before Syracuse ended the game by coming back from a two to one deficit, taking both the fourth and fifth set. During the game, three Syracuse players registered double digit kills. Ava Palm, Skylar Georgia, and a career first for, for Zaira Harris Wadi. Head coach Bakir Garanatnam said he's happy for the team and proud of the way they performed all the way to the end. The team heads to, the, to North Carolina to play NC State on Friday and Wake Forest on Sunday for a full weekend of ACC play. A big celebration for Syracuse Volleyball and Nico Horning continues the excitement with an upcoming theme night put on by Syracuse's local hockey team. Well, Taylor Swift isn't coming to the Dome or any other venue here in Central New York for right now, but a night dedicated to Swift's Eras Tour hits the ice this weekend. No one can get tickets to this concert. So we thought, let's give away tickets. And luckily, uh, Fan Cave Tickets, who's one of our partners, were able to get a hold of two tickets, and that's where it all came together. The planning of Era's Night at Saturday's Syracuse Crunch minor league hockey game gets put to the test. Cahill explains the goal of bringing in Swifties who don't particularly have an interest in hockey. So we're getting a lot of Taylor Swift fans, and we know there's a lot of them in central New York, to come to the game and experience Crunch hockey for the first time. While Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey might not be walking out of this tunnel together here on Saturday, there will still be several Syracuse Crunch and Belleville Senators players to watch skate in front of many Swifties. We're excited to see the outfits. We're excited to see the fandom. Uh, we know Swifties are a very hardcore fan base, and it's awesome. They have a lot of love for Taylor Swift. So I think it's going to be really cool when they come in their outfits and they have their friendship bracelets, and we hope that there is going to be the friendship bracelet trading and everything that you expect at the Eras Tour happening here. Friendship bracelets have become a huge part of Swift's tour, but that's not the only thing the Crunch are promoting on Saturday. So we'll have obviously that bracelet making station in Memorial Hall. We're going to have a DJ in Memorial Hall playing just Taylor Swift music. Obviously you'll hear Taylor Swift music in the arena. 
Um, and then the big thing is the, the ticket giveaway that we're going to be announcing uh, during the third period. Two lucky fans will walk away with free Eras Tour tickets in Toronto, but Cahill describes the feeling she'd prefer to see from most fans after the game. I want them excited about crunch hockey. Maybe they've never been to a hockey game before, or they've never been to one in Syracuse. I want them to, to see how passionate our fan base is, to see how exciting the game is, to fall in love with the sport and how fast the athletes are on the ice and how passionate the fans are when they're cheering and everything about the environment and coming to a crunch game. Maybe some fans will be feeling 22 uh, on Saturday when the Syracuse Crunch hosts the Belleville Senators at 7 o'clock. All right, we go now from the rink to the hardwood with Geraldine Paglia. Thanks, Nico. Last night, head coach Felicia Legetjak led Syracuse's women's basketball team in a 90-50 win against Damon in their first exhibition game. Kira Wood side, recorded Damon, a double-double at half thing, with 10 points and 11 rebounds. Finishing the night, Wood had 16 points and a team high of 14 rebounds. Kira Scott and Shai Hawkins also contributed 16 points each, showing a strong offensive front for Syracuse. Syracuse dominated, out-rebounding out Damon 63-30, to including 21 offensive rebounds. The Orange were a force in the paint, scoring 58 of their 90 points inside. Last night's game saw nine of the ten players who saw the floor for SU got on the board within the first half, helping secure the win and provide it, and proving to be a deep team with, promising, with promise for the season. Elevate has been the word of the preseason, and that definitely showed last night. After losing guard Dyer Jafera, there was a lot of question around what this season would look like. The Orange will look to officially kick off their regular season against Niagara on Tuesday, November 5th in the Dome. We can talk about the box score as much as possible, but this game came down to two places, and the first was the Mookie Betts play in the first inning. I mean, yeah, this World Series game, it was absolutely incredible. It's exactly what you wanted to see, but you talked about how early on in the MLB, in the World Series nonetheless, that you have a key play like Mookie Betts going towards the right field line, diving up, getting the ball, and then it gets ripped out of his hands. Nico, I know you had a reaction to it. Uh, what are we doing? I mean, this is, this is uh, 2024, and this Yankee fan is going to try and rip the baseball out of Mookie Betts, and then his friend right next to him is going to try and hold his hand. I mean, these, these two rivals go back way to 1981, the last time these two teams played against each other in the World Series, and it's just a bad look for, for baseball. There's, it's one thing to interfere with a home run, but if you're going to try and rip the baseball out of the guy's glove, uh, that, that's just that's crossing the line. Yeah, you could definitely hurt somebody in a play like that. It's not what you want to see. But to see Mookie Betts, you kind of imagined that would be the spark plug for this Dodgers team. They were up 2-0 at the point. Freddie Freeman, we know what he can do in the, the postseason. But then it kind of took a turn for the Yankees. Anthony Volpe, the New York kid, well, he did what he did best, Geraldine, and he just absolutely mashed a grand slam. Oh, my God, absolutely. And, Nate, we were both here in the control room, and absolute cheers all around. I mean, no one could really believe it. And here, I'm sure, out in the ball field, there was cheers going all around. It was just absolutely incredible. And then they win with a massive lead. It was uh, the turning point in the series, and we'll see if they can take that into tonight against, uh, against the Dodgers again. But, you know, for them to find their stride finally, the bats have been so quiet. And for Volpe, who's been struggling, for Judge, who is still struggling, uh, there's at least some momentum that they can potentially carry into the rest of the series. I mean, now you set yourself up with your ace, Garrett Cole, who's projected to take the mound tonight against the rookie in Yoshinobu Yamamoto. He's struggled at times, had above a six ERA. This is the perfect time if you are going to be the first team in Major League Baseball history to come back from a 3-0 deficit in the World Series. You set yourself up for success. You won game four. Now the focus is on tonight. Maybe they can do it. Maybe they can't. But only time will tell. One game at a time. That's the approach that you have to take. They talked a lot about the broadcast uh, on the broadcast last night about uh, the early 2000s World Series between the Red Sox and Yankees and what happened there. So it uh, should be another good one, but never know. Win or lose for the Dodgers. One game at a time, and we're going to take you one sec segment at a time. But coming up, Halloween is upon us, and our very own Mornings on the Hill crew is ready to celebrate. Stay tuned to see what tricks and treats they have in store right after the break. Good morning. I'm Alexia Kuslis here with the Morning Juice. Halloween is approaching, and that means candy, pumpkins, and, of course, costumes. 
So I've asked a few of the Moth staffers what they are going to dress up for this year. Um, this year I'm going to be Buzz Lightyear. Betty Boop. I am going to play the role of Dog Whisper this Halloween. We have a Golden Doodle and a King Cavalier who don't do well when there's a lot of knocking at the door. So my role will be to placate two dogs. Consider me the Dog Whisperer. I am going to be Catwoman this year and my boyfriend's gonna be Batman. I'm currently deciding between Glenda the Good Witch or Curious George. Me, myself, and I. For Halloween, I'm being Little Red Riding Hood. I'm going to be Jim Behan. I'm going to be Happy Gilmore's caddy. This year for Halloween, I'm going to be Bill Nye, the science guy. Um, I'm being Cher, the 70s icon herself. You know, just me in a hot dog suit, a little mustard, a little ketchup, you know, you know the vibes. I don't have anything planned. How come? I just don't celebrate Halloween. Well, I'm actually not dressing up, uh, but I am wearing a shirt, ordered on Amazon. It's coming on Friday. And apparently, I say yes sir a lot to my friends. So it's a shirt that says yes sir, all caps, with an exclamation point. Let's go. By the way, according to the National Retail Federation, consumers are expected to spend $11.6 billion on Halloween this year. We are talking about things like decorations, displays, costumes, accessories, and candy. Speaking of candy, what are your guys' favorite Halloween candy? Um, I would have to say Jolly Ranchers, uh, Sour Patch Kids, anything sour, I, I really do like it. I agree. What about you, Zach? I do love the sour stuff, but I'm a big Twix guy myself. Yep. Yeah. Do you guys have any special plans for this weekend? So this weekend I plan on just kind of like going downtown, kind of showing off my costume a little bit, mm -hmm. maybe for a couple hours and then I'm headed back. Okay. Yeah, in true Jim Beheim fashion, you'll see this jacket flying all around. <laughs> All right, well, that's all we have for this Wednesday on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Benaya Johnson. Follow us on social media.